Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Everton show here on Made in Liverpool. We're in the final month of the calendar year now, the games are coming thick and fast and every Evertonian just wants an upturn in fortunes for Christmas. It was a long, long way home from the south coast last Sunday, especially as we were empty handed. But we go again this weekend and it's no less than Jose Mourinho and Manchester United at Goodison Park. Snods is alongside me this week, no better game to bounce back, Snods? Certainly not. Big game, uh, big club. Should be a great atmosphere. Uh, our fans will be up for it. Hopefully the players will be up for it. We need a big performance on Sunday and hopefully uh, the boys will produce that. The atmosphere is crucial, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, you're always, the fans are always waiting for something to happen. The players have got to make things happen for them. So, yeah, it's important that we put a good show on. Very much a game to look forward to. We'll be looking into the visit of Manchester United to Goodison Park a bit later in the programme. Here's a taste of what else is coming up in the next hour. The guys here have been making big steps and you know it's good to see. You know, another very positive thing that's being done in the community. If any ever a manager was going to fit a football club, as in Royal Koeman coming into Everton, I think it's the perfect fit because I think he's no nonsense and that's what I think Evertonians have always been about. It's gone great, yeah. And um, we got some sleep, um, some uh, questionable snorers along the way that, that nobody's owning up to. And we know, and we have to, to do that. Well, it was obviously a very big day for Ronald Koeman last Sunday, with it being his first return to Southampton since swapping St Mary's for Goodison Park. But if he was hoping to get off to a good start in front of an unforgiving crowd, he certainly didn't get it. Yeah, it's very frustrated because we had uh, we had the kickoff, and then it's not possible that we lose the ball after 10 seconds and that they score after one minute because that's not the way how you how you need to start the game and you know that makes it very difficult both sides had chances didn't they yeah of course the second half was was much better i think uh, the team put a lot of effort on the pitch we won more second balls uh, not really open chances but we were dangerous we were dangerous and uh, maybe we deserved the goal but OK, also uh, we have to recognise that uh, Southampton get some good chances to kill the game after the 1-0. But uh, the problem was uh, again today how we start the game, because uh, to concede that one goal after one minute, that makes uh, not the confidence to the player what you need to play. The best chances probably fell to address again Gareth Barry, not recognised goal scorers. We're, we're a little bit short of luck at the moment, to be fair, aren't we? Yeah, but Ghana had maybe one good good chance in the box that needs to be on target. But OK, also one header uh, from Carrot in the second post. Uh, Williams one time, uh, second half. We were dangerous, we played well, but it, it's, it wasn't enough. And, and because yeah, you conceded the goal so fast in the game, and that makes them stronger because they, they drop back after 1-0. And you know, and I know, uh, they have really good defending and uh, the, keep, the goalkeeper is still the same, the defenders are the same, I know, and then it's difficult to score. It's not to concede the goal inside the first minute is bad enough, but when you consider that we kicked off, it, it's criminal. Yeah, that's the most disappointing aspect of it. Uh, we had the kick-off and you like to keep the ball for the first at least 30 seconds. Mm. I think we give it away after 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, and to concede after 43, people say lack of concentration. I don't know, but a uh, very disappointing goal to give away as well. You can't blame the manager, surely, can you, when a team concedes a goal after 43 seconds? Not at all, because I, I know how the boss thinks on football and he, he, he's always saying to him, look, start the start to a game is important. Get out there and, and start from the first whistle, get after players, defend properly, attack properly. And so, no, you can't blame the manager at all for conceding a goal after such short space of time. It rocked us for a little bit as well, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Uh, it took us a lot to get over it. I thought we were disappointing first 45 minutes at least. Uh, because Southampton were beatable. There's no mm. question about that, but we just didn't perform, really. It was a bad day. Well, the general consensus of opinion after the game was that Everton did slightly better in the second half than we'd done in the opening 45 minutes. But although that was still wasn't good enough to force a level, at Yannick Bellassi did as much as anyone to at least pose a few questions of the Saints' defence. This was Yannick's take on proceedings after the match. The game plan changes... Uh... You know, after conceding a goal early, um, and I'm sure the boys are disappointed. You know, because 
lately we've always been we've always we're always having to react after a goal, you know, to come into the game. It's just an uphill battle, isn't it, psychologically when you concede so early? Yeah, definitely, you know, for any team, um, especially for us, obviously, where the results haven't been the best, you know, last couple. And, uh, you know, it's up to us boys to, to put it right. And we've got another tough, tough game coming up on Sunday. But in front of our home crowd, you know, we're going to have to put up a fight and stand up. But I know, you know, it's always been a big game at Goodison, especially. And, you know, I'm sure the fans are going to be up to it. But us boys got to be equal and ready to stand up and you know, putting a hard effort in because it's going to be another tough game. As I said to the gaffer there, Snodds, in his post-match interview, we did have chances, but unfortunately they fell to the wrong players, didn't they? Yeah, and there were, there were decent chances. Mm -hmm. uh, the one Adrissa had uh, that put over the ball, that was a great chance. I thought he'd have finished it, to be quite honest. But yeah, is it right saying the wrong, wrong players? They're, they're in a good situation there. You've just got to hit the target, at least make the keeper make a save. So, yeah, we did have half chances, Daz, and disappointed that we didn't put one away. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But just a little bit of composure. Take your time and pick your spot. It's easy for us to say from the commentary position, isn't it? It's not easy for me to say because I weren't the best finisher <laughs> in the world anyway. Uh, people say I rushed one or two things, so I've been in them situations. It's not as easy as it looks, but uh, yeah, if you get half a chance, you've got to try and hit the target. It was just another bad day at the office, wasn't it? Right, let's leave St Mary's far behind us now, just as we did, by the way, on the four-hour journey back to Merseyside on Sunday. Our next feature is all about Leighton Baines having a go at graffiti. Now that's not a pastime we endorse of course unless supervised at an appropriate venue. But Leighton was keen to learn more when he heard about our Everton in the Community Breathing Space initiative that gives vulnerable young people on Merseyside an avenue in which to channel their energy. Leighton enjoyed himself as we're about to see now. So today we're down here with the Breathing Space programme and um, the Breathing Space programme is for looked after children across Merseyside aged 14 to 19 um, so we gain referrals from social services from different kinds of family intervention programmes and really just try and provide different kinds of programmes for, for our young people who are, who are at need. It was nice to get involved and, and I think you know the end product looked look pretty decent as well but as I say it, it's more about uh, what it's achieving you know, with, with the kids who are, who are coming down really and, you know, how much it's helping them. It means the world to them, to be honest, for him to be here interacting with today, like a, like a role model just there, it's great. It'll it'll give them a real boost. Um, yeah, obviously graffiti is one of the things we do today, but uh, there's lots of stuff we do. Um, at the moment, we're doing a lot like cooking um, with the young people, so learning about kind of cooking on a budget or healthy food. Um, they currently do in rock climbing as well. It's about giving them uh, new opportunities. It's been really interesting coming down and gives them an opportunity to, to get out and sort of get a little bit creative as well. Some help maybe just with confidence and self-esteem. Being outdoors and all of a sudden, you know, going out and finding jobs, working jobs, coming here and the guys here have been making big steps and, you know, it's good to see. You know, another very positive thing that's being done in the community. Uh, we look to improve um, our young people's um, health and well-being, their confidence and self-esteem by giving them the opportunity to take part in diversionary activities like the graffiti session today. It kind of gives them a bit of confidence that way. Well, I haven't tried that before. Maybe I can. Maybe I can achieve in that too. The creative theme today ties in quite nicely with the T-shirt campaign that Leighton's a part of. We've obviously got the T-shirts that uh, Leighton, Jerry, and Mo've done. And um, it's just uh, really, really important, really, because obviously some of the money raised is going to go to the Everton community. I think the image is just something sort of I, I probably would associate with myself, you know, that, you know, whether it's, you know, if it's a, a goal, I don't really go wild, you know, it's just more of an acknowledgement to the to the fans for the support. I think the, the wording is a bit like Beatles here, isn't it? That sort of vibe. Just raising the, raising the money for a good cause, really, and... You know, if people are interested, you know, go and buy any of them and, you know, know that, you know, a good chunk of money is going to, to a good cause. On and off the pitch, Snod's Leighton Baines just gets it, doesn't he? He really does. He loves getting out in the community, uh, going to different uh, places and uh, very creative as well. He created his own T-shirt, front yeah. of his T-shirt. So, uh, yeah, he's a bit of a bright spark, his Baines. He. Looked a bit of fun, the old graffiti there, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did, to be honest. It did. Uh, I'm useless at things like that, though. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I'm sure it's something we wouldn't send you to anyway. A graffiti can, you must be joking. That's it for part one of this week's programme. Coming up after this short break, we'll see if the under-23s did any better away at Southampton than the first team did. And we'll follow David Unsworth and his players on a Goodison Park sleepover, all in the name of charity on a bitterly cold 
and Dark Knight. Welcome back to part two of the Everton Show. Now, 24 hours after the first team lost at Southampton, the Blues under-23s went to the Saints Academy complex to see if they could do any better. And they did. They came back to Merseyside with a creditable 1-1 draw that keeps Everton at the top of the table. Everton under-23s increased their lead at the top of Premier League 2 to two points with a one all draw at Southampton on Monday night. The young Blues were dominant throughout and had the first real chance of the match when Umar Nias found Dominic Calvert-Lewin on the edge of the box and the forward pulled a save from goalkeeper Harry Lewis. In Fela Olomola, Southampton had a threat of their own however and the striker fired this warning shot soon after that was well turned over by Matthias Huelt. Eleven minutes before the break, the Toffees' pressure finally paid off. Liam Walsh bided his time before finding John Joe Kenny and his cross was well turned home by Nias. Ahead, Everton's lead would last less than 60 seconds as David Unsworth's side were caught cold. From the kickoff, Southampton broke down the right-hand side and the ball eventually found its way to Ola Muller to steer in via the post. The young Blues remained on top in the second half and Callum Connolly tried his best to find a winner after galloping forward from left back. There was no way past Lewis, but the draw doubled Everton's points advantage over second place Manchester City. They next faced Portsmouth in the Premier League Cup next Monday at Southport's Merseyrail Community Stadium. That was a decent result for the boys, Snods, well, having taken the lead to then surrender the lead within 60 seconds. Unzi would have been livid, wouldn't he? Yeah, that's as criminal as conceding in the first minute, like the first team did, uh, to concede straight after you're scoring, because the first thing you say after you score a goal is, right, let's keep it tight now, let's not get, let them get back into the game so easily, and it, and it happened, so he would have been disappointed. Looked a great finish from Umar, uh, mm -hmm. terrific. Our folly uh, put us in the lead, but then yeah, concede so so straight after it, disappointing. You've been in this situation, Snods, as a young player. The young boys are top of the table, mm. they're edging towards the end of the season. Will they start to feel the pressure a little bit? Um, I think that depends on the manager as well, uh, how calm he is, and I think Unzi's a calming influence on them young lads. I think he's he's great around them. Uh, he wants them to go out and express themselves. So uh, no, it'll come from him, and he won't have any nerves, any edge about him, and he'll just tell them to keep going out and playing every game as they're playing now, and they're playing with plenty of confidence. He may lose a couple of players on loan in January, might he? Yeah, he might do. Uh, that might be a bad thing for David, but it's not a bad thing for the kids. Mm. It's important that they go out and get first-team football somewhere along the line. It's a terrific education, isn't it, league football? Well, after that 1-1 draw at Southampton, we caught up with defender Callum Connolly, and he agreed that a share of the spoils was a decent return from a testing fixture. It was a um, tough game, Southampton a good side, and I thought throughout the game we dominated, and we should have won, to be fair. Pretty p disappointed only to take a point? Yeah, um, we had enough chances um, in the first half and second half mainly. Um, I had a few chances myself and should have put a few away, but that's football. You was playing left back as well last night, a different position from where you've, you've played mainly this season? Um, yeah, I've been playing centre half a lot of season, but um, I feel like I'm versatile enough to play in left back and centre back, so I don't mind. How easy is it, how easy is it to switch from one position to another, from, from game to game, week to week? I wouldn't say it's easy, but I've played left back, right back, centre back, and midfield all the way through my career so far. So I wouldn't say it's that easy, but um, I've had a lot of training in the positions, so just um, got to keep going on and see where I'll um, finish off in my career. So last night you had a instructions to get forward a bit more than you probably would normally playing at left back. Yeah, in the first half and. Um, I wouldn't say I was getting forward enough, but in the second half, I got a um, kick off the backside and then got, a for got forward um, quite a bit. The league table's still looking pretty nice. Top of the table with uh, 23 points after 11 games. Yeah, top of the table, happy days. Um, I think we would have thought we would have been in this position at the start of the season with the, um, with the group we've got. We've got um, some um, great players in the squad and um, hopefully we'll at the end of the season, we um, come out as champions. 
He's a versatile young man, Callum Connolly. You like the look of him, don't you? I do. It's important that he's versatile as well because you never know. The first team might need him in, in a central position, uh, centre-back, as a left-back if, if necessary. So, uh, yeah, it's important that, uh, that he can play several positions. I like him. He's composed on the ball. He got forward, as we could see in the little clips there. Not, not afraid to use his right foot. A couple of right foot strikes. So, yeah, he's an aggressive player as well. Uh, something that I, I like <laughs> and uh, no, I think he's got a future the boy I really do first team have won one in nine so there's a little clamour on social media and what have you to put the young boys in but it's not as simple as that is it it's not as simple as that no we, we have got a big squad and perhaps one or two are not playing to the, to the top of the game at the minute but uh, yeah you can't just go there throwing three and four young kids in uh, because if, you, if you're getting beat, it dents their confidence a little bit. All right, the crowd will be a little bit apprehensive, but now you can't play them all together. Well, something different now. We're sticking with the under-23s for our next piece of home here on the Everton Show. But instead of wearing footy boots and shin pads and trying to win valuable points for the team, the players were in thick sweatshirts, padded coats and sleeping bags trying to raise valuable pounds for charity. They all volunteered, or at least David Unsworth volunteered them, to do a sleepover inside the stadium to raise money and awareness for the Everton in the Community Homeless Initiative. It was cold, it was dark, it was downright unpleasant, but credit to Unzi and the boys because they saw it through. We're here this evening to support our homeless programme. You know we work at the Whitechapel Centre, run weekly football um, sessions with Whitechapel here at Everton, so uh, we're here to raise some much needed funds this evening to continue our programme. It's something new isn't it, and it's, uh, it's for a great cause and we mustn't, as um, you know, jovial as the lads are at the moment, we mustn't forget we're doing it for, for a great cause and um, you know, people do this seriously uh, every night and for years and years, so we're very serious about raising a lot of money uh, for the homeless in Liverpool and putting that right. It's something that not a lot of us have done, so it's going to be an interesting night. It's a, it's a great cause and it's something that we need to respect. It's really good for me and all the lads to get involved. Obviously, Everton as a club is really big on the, the community side, so it's good to give back. Obviously, we play football for a living and we're in a priv very privileged position, so uh, to do this and raise some funds for it as well is it's really good. I think what David Unsworth has done with them has been fantastic. Um, and for, the, for him to bring them here, I think shows a real commitment to the world out there and not just football. We're here to produce players but we're also here to produce really good humble young men and uh, you know uh, they know what it means for the, this club and the community and, and to help the, um, the homeless on the streets of Liverpool. Just a huge thank you really to David Unsworth and the under 23s it's just fantastic it shows their attitude um, you know his, uh, his heart as big as a smile I think David Unsworth and he that, you know that goes through the team so uh, really very very grateful for the time they're giving tonight. We've got to look after our own community, we really do and um, you know, nobody should be sleeping out, especially on a night last like this, it's freezing tonight and um, you know, quite seriously and quite honestly, not, you know, that shouldn't be happening to anybody in this day and age. It's gone great, yeah, and um, we've got some sleep, um, some uh, questionable snorers along the way that, that nobody's owning up to, uh, but no, it was, um, it was a tough night, I have to say it was cold, really cold. Um, but we got through it and um, you know, hopefully we raised a lot of money. It's been fantastic. What a wonderful opportunity to see our under-23s, the backroom staff, fans all out in the stadium raising funds for our homeless project. But for one night, you know, we can sit there and say, oh yeah, we did it, but we're all wrapped up. You know, we've got layers of clothing on, we're in our sleeping bags, but people do this for real and that's, that's the real scary thing. And that's, that's the reason why we're doing it, because we want to stop that. We want to give all those people who are on the streets of Liverpool a, you know, a helping hand and get back on the feet again. There was representation literally from the board down to the fans uh, and it was great to see the young players there. It was nice that, that you had that sense of, well, we're Everton, aren't we? <laughs> we're the biggest family in football, we really are, um, and the work that Everton and the community do. What a family to belong to, it's a privilege, isn't it? We'd do it again, you know, to, you know, to help and, to, and to, to raise that awareness um, is the biggest thing that can come out of this. Snobs, I've watched that piece of film time and time again. I can't see you anywhere. I was otherwise engaged, or I would have definitely been there, Daz, <laughs> without a shadow of a doubt. They, but what Unzi's done is mm. uh, he's told the lads, hey, come on, let's get out, let's do our bit. And uh, it looked absolutely freezing, but uh, to the credit, every one of them went out. They're aware of the situation uh, around the streets of Liverpool and the country, to be honest. So uh, I think it's a great effort what they did. I did say tongue-in-cheek that David Unsworth volunteered them all, and he did, but 
they backed it, the young lads, to be fair. Yeah, and that's why they're at the, David Unsworth said they were, he wants them to be footballers, but he wants them to be humble young men as well. And, uh, and realise that uh, it's a big world out there, and if they weren't footballers, then some, in reality, somebody could be living like that, which they are. So, uh, yeah, it's a great effort, and all the lads did it with a smile on the face. I'm sure they were freezing through the night, but they all got through it, and credit to them. We've been to Goodison Park at night games for reserve games mm. when there's not 38,000 people in there. It can be cold. It can be cold. You do, you get wrapped up, you put your hats on, your gloves on and everything, and you're still uncomfortable. So to be in a sleeping bag through the night. Um, but I just can't say enough. I think, I think they've done a great job. Absolutely fantastic. All credit to the lads. They braved it out and they did what they promised to do. David Hennon, by the way, was still shivering two days later. As for me, I was shivering at the very thought of it, but I was already down in Southampton anyway. Well done indeed to everyone involved. We'll be back on The Everton Show in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to part three and it's time for our big interview. This week we're speaking to a former Everton player who has seamlessly swapped the football pitch for the television and radio studios. Kevin Kilban was always among the more articulate members of the Blue squads during his time at Goodison, so it's not really surprising that he's taken so well to the world of football punditry. He was at the Ronald Koeman fan event recently, so we caught up with him to speak about his time at Goodison, his participation in the New York Marathon and his enduring affection for Everton Football Club. So many memories, so many characters that, that, that are around the club, not just within the dressing room at that time, when I was part of the club, just around the dressing room, you know, <coughs> around the football club, character after character. And, and again, that's the heartbeat of the club. That's what, that's what makes any club. And I just feel as though at Everton, Everton have had it right for such a long time around the football team, not necessarily the team itself. The, the people around the club have, have, always, have always been perfect. And that's what I think makes Everton. And it's great that you, you are here tonight alongside Lee Carsley, who's, who's a good friend of yours, someone you're quite close to. Yeah, Lee's my best mate. Lee, Lee's, um, you know, we, we've known each other before. We both signed for, for Everton uh, with playing for Ireland together. But we are, we are best mates. We're very, very close. We'll speak to each other almost, if not every day. So whether it'll be the odd text where he'll abuse me or whatever it'll be, or it'll be the phone call, we, yeah, we speak to each other regularly. And that's been the case for 10, 15 years. He's my best mate, so... Yeah, he'll, he'll probably give you a bit, a bit of, or tell you a few things about me, give me a bit of stick, but yeah, I love him to death, yeah. Of course, you've, you've just flown back from America the last week or so. Tell us what you were doing over there in New York. Yeah, I was over running the New York Marathon uh, last Sunday. Uh, that was tough, tough going it was, um, especially when you have a, a slight injury along, along the route. But yeah, I was running the down, for the Down Syndrome Association. Um, I've, I've worked with the Down Syndrome Association since my eldest daughter, Elsie, was born when I was part of Everton at that time. Um, again, that's maybe something why I've got such a strong bond with the club as well, for, for how the club came together after Elsie was born. It was a huge shock to me and to my family at that particular time. But the club came together around me, again, teammates who I would class as friends now because of how they came around me and how they supported me through a difficult time. But not just my teammates, as I said before, it was the people around the club, everybody. and. That's why I've got. That's why I've got so much respect for this place, and that's why I'll, I'll always, you know, I'll always come back with a smile on my face because, because of what happened during those time. But yeah, I ran the New York Marathon for, for the Down Syndrome Association, so managed to raise a few quid. So that was the most important thing, and uh, yeah, it was pleasing just to get round uh, last Sunday. How how much money did you raise? What what time did you do the marathon in? I did it in four four hours thirteen. So I I was actually very disappointed with that. I really was disappointed. I was expected to run about uh, certainly under under three thirty, three three fifteen. I'd done a three fourteen marathon um, a couple of years ago, so I was expected to go something around that. But I did pull my calf halfway around, so that wasn't great. Again, the legs probably going on me. The muscles are not as strong as they probably once were. So uh, yeah, the time wasn't the best. Uh, as for total, I think it's around about six thousand now. And um, I actually another thing, I didn't promote it enough. I didn't, I didn't promote it like I probably should have done. Um, the, the Down Syndrome Association were on to me. They were saying to me, "Look, can you just give it a few plugs? Give it and and you always feel as though you're kind of leaning on people. You're always putting people under too much pressure when you start to promote it a bit too much. But the last week, 
I sent a few texts to a few lads and a few people who I know who I knew started to promote it a little bit more on Twitter, and all of a sudden the total went up tenfold. So I, I think it's around about five thousand now, and, and there is still more coming in as well. So around about five thousand pounds. So I've got to be happy with that. Yeah. From what you've seen of Everton so far this season, with your your, your pundit's hat on now, yeah. what changes have you noticed from the way we played last season to the way we play now since well, Donald Kuma's coming? I think first of all it's quite glaring. I think every Everton will say that much better defensively. I, mean, I say that with the Chelsea defeat a few weeks ago, but take that aside, Everton have been much better defensively and. There was certainly a turn in Romelu Lukaku's form, I think, uh, whatever's been said to him, what, a month, six weeks ago, to get him back firing again as well. I think that was very important for Everton because getting him back going again, I think it gives a lift to the whole side and that that's that was hugely important. So you've got to maybe perhaps credit, obviously, Romelu Lukaku himself, but credit the manager for getting in his ear, getting him back on side because there's certainly been a, a, a change within him, I, I felt, as well, watching them. Um, and I think in general... You look into all. I, I'm always looking to the Irish boys. I'm always looking at Seamus Coleman. I think he's getting better and better. He's put. He's got the armband now for Ireland and become captain. I think he's excelling. I think he's getting better and better every season. James McCarthy's another I would watch. Darren Gibson, Ed McGeady, although he's he's gone along to Preston, who I would obviously keep an eye on f for them as well. Who's actually playing quite well. So you look to the Irish boys. But aside of that, I think. I think Everton have got a strong side. I think Balassi is a very good signing. I'm looking to him this season now to provide assists and, and of course, get his, his own fair share goal, of goals himself. Defensively, I think Asi Williams, I think he's been a, an excellent signing. I think alongside Jagielka, who, whoever it's going to be this season, I think Everton have got the nucleus of experience with Leighton Baines, of course, still around, Jagielka, Williams' experience, Seamus Coleman, who's now maturing even more with the, with the more inexperienced players to try to help the likes of Ross Barkley. I'm looking for him as well to try to kick on over the next year or two and fulfil his potential. So there's a lot of positives. There, there really are a lot of positives. And I, and I do feel that even listening to Ronald Koeman talking, I think the club's probably short of maybe two or three players. And I think that will be addressed in, in this next coming window in January and beyond that. So I think the issues that, that are there that will need to be addressed will be addressed. And I think going forward, Everton are in a strong position. And finally, Kev, obviously you're here tonight in the company of Ronald Koeman. Have you had a chance to chat to him? Have you have you, your paths crossed at all in, over the last few years? No, they haven't at all. I mean, I cracked one down there, but I, I grew up supporting Ireland, as probably as everyone would know that. Uh, so I seen him score against England in, what was it, 92, something like 93, something like that, whatever it was, towards the end of Graham Taylor's reign. I think it actually cost Graham Taylor his job as England manager. And, Everyone in our house, we were off. The, we were off the city that night. We were off the couch supporting Holland. So, as bad as that sounds, that that's how it was maybe in my house growing up. So, we all know. We all know. I in my head, first of all, I think of Ronald Koeman, the player. I think of him scoring the European Cup final for Barcelona at Wembley. I, I see him scoring goals, um, so many free kicks for Holland, being being such a, a linchpin for Holland as well during those top sides that they had Barcelona. So. He was a, a top-class footballer, and I think his transition to management has been, I wouldn't say it's been seamless, because he's probably had a few ups and downs as well, but you look at him at Benfica, you look at him at Altmar, you look at him at you know the various clubs he's been at, then you look at him at Southampton going in there, you look at the job that he's done at Southampton. It's, it's a great step for him now to come into Everton. I think, I think he's the manager that, if, you, if, if I'm looking at Everton now and I'm looking at a side that want to go on now to that next level and start challenging the top four, start challenging for trophies, he's the ideal manager. To be honest with you, I just don't think, I don't think he, he talks rubbish. I don't think he does. I think he's, I think he's straight talking. I think he says it as it is. As a player, that's exactly what I would want from him. Would you appreciate that as a player? The yeah, part, you, totally appreciate it. The manager it. says it is, straight to the point. If I'm not playing well, I want him to tell me I'm not playing well. I want him to tell me how I can improve. I don't want him to beat about the bush. I don't want him to skirt around the edges and, and tell me tell me things that weren't necessarily true. With Ronald Koeman, I'd feel as though, as a player, some players might not like that, don't, don't take me wrong, but I think some play, most players should listen to what he's saying to them. He's been there, he's done it as a player. He's been there now and he's doing it as a manager. So if he's telling you that something isn't quite right, you've got to take it on board and you've got to try and then adjust. You've got to try and get better because of that. So he's the ideal man, I think. I think, I think if any, ever a manager was going to fit a football club, as in Ronald Koeman coming into Everton, I think it's the perfect fit because I think he's no nonsense. And that's what I think Evertonians have always been about. Killer was another great lad during his time at Everton Snods. Never a superstar, but every team needs a Kevin Kilban type player. Yeah, not only on the pitch, but in the dressing room as well. Mm. Uh, good company, 
good lad, likes a laugh. So uh, I can imagine him in a dressing room environment being a good lad as well. So, and he always give his all, whether he were playing well or not playing well, he wouldn't stop running, he wouldn't stop chasing back, tackling, etc. So, yeah, good, good, good club, uh, club player and international player. Uh, many, many games for mm. Republic of Ireland and uh, a likeable lad. And good at his job now. I was just going to say, he's doing mm. well at the old television and the radio. He's yeah. got a big radio show in Ireland. I like listening to him. I think he, he talks sense. He talks well. And, uh, yeah, he's doing very well, well on that side of it. You spoke there about Ronald Koeman being the right man for the job, the right man for Everton Football Club. And he is, isn't he? I have no question about it. He is. Uh, he will get things right. Uh, I've spoken with him on several occasions. He, he, he wants Everton to be successful. And uh, I... I Really do think he's the man. I think we'll see a few signings come January and in the summer especially. And I think uh, Ronald Koeman will get Everton up where we belong in that top four. It's not the easiest time of the year to recruit, is it, January? No, it isn't. It'd be difficult. A lot of fans have spoke to me saying, oh, we need plenty of players in January, but they're all in Europe, all the better players. And it's not good just going for players that are going to make squads, uh, Everton squad. We need to improve the team, so he, he's got to be looking better than what we've got at the minute. And that ain't going to be easy in January, so I'm expecting one or two, but mainly in, uh, in the summer I think we'll see several. European football, European qualification has still got to be the aim for Everton this season, hasn't it? Without a doubt, we're in seventh place, all right. We've, not, we've lost some uh, silly games that I, that I think we should have picked up more points in. Uh, it is frustrating at, at this present time. But we've got to start winning games and we've got to start competing and get back up into the Europa positions at least. And uh, let's see where we go from there. There's a long, long way to go yet, isn't there? Sure it? is. It's a 2016-2017 campaign. And that brings us to the three-quarter mark in this week's show. Coming up in the final quarter, we look ahead to the visit of Manchester United to Goodison Park on Sunday afternoon. And we speak to a man who played for both teams and is still highly regarded at both ends of the M62, Andrei Kanchelskis. <laughs> We've reached the fourth and final part of this week's show and we're starting it with Andrei Kanchelskis, a man who illuminated Goodison Park during his brief stay at the club. Signed from Manchester United in the summer of 1995, he averaged a goal every two Premier League games in his only full season with Everton. He always speaks fondly about Evertonians and so we invited the fans to pose the questions when Andrei called in to see us recently. I think so, no, because my best uh, game at Everton uh, is uh, it's Derby against Liverpool at, at Anfield. We, I scored two goals, we won 2-1, uh, three points, important for the teams. And uh, also uh, a good night for the uh, Everton fans and uh, for myself as well. Duncan Ferguson is a great guy, a big guy, just a good forward, you know, it's, um, I think so, it's a uh, it's nice, uh, nice person, you know, as well. Yeah, my son is a big Everton fan, you know, it's my daughter, big uh, Man United fan, it's uh, always fighting. Uh, Man United, Everton. It's uh, anyway. Just I'm. Um, is this in life and uh, under life? Uh, yeah. I never say to uh, take for the fans Everton or another club. Uh, is this Andre self, you know? Is this uh, is it Andre uh, choice, you know? Is this why no? I just. Uh, it's better with Scottish accent, you know. When I'm playing uh, in Scotland, sometimes I don't understand what uh, what coach said, you know. <laughs> it's better. It's uh, anyway. It's uh, no matter accent. It's, it's good. Uh, Liverpool people. It's nice people, you know. It's um, uh, this important, you know.
very difficult play against Paolo Maldini. You know, is he playing in Milan? He's playing national team Italy. I think so. It's very difficult play against him. A wide man with blistering pace who creates goals and scores goals in equal measure. Do that, Andre Kanchelskis. Now, couldn't we? Every club could. Every club, you're right. Uh, I know talking to Graham Stewart about him. I didn't, uh, unfortunately, didn't play with Andre. I'd left the club, but uh, Graham Stewart rates him very, very highly. I'm sure he said he's probably the best player he's played alongside mm. Diamond, so he must uh, rate him very highly. But he were, he were pacey, he could score goals, and uh, you'd pay millions for a player like that these days. What needs to change at Everton, Snods? Oh, it's a tough, tough question, Daz, because uh, I think the players are well capable in a performance in, and there's no question about that. Um, I really don't know the answer to that it's one. It's a tough one, isn't it? It is a tough one. Uh, just get the self-belief back uh, as, a, as a team and uh, start winning games. We've got a great run of games here against big clubs, big oppositions. And if we can get some wins against these kind of teams, that'll give us the confidence then to kick on after Christmas. So just self-belief. Get mm. that self-belief back. Get winning tattles. Get the ball forward quickly and let's work for one another. Nothing like hard work. If you work hard, it brings you success. The big characters are important, aren't they? Yeah, they are, and we have some big characters. We've got some leaders out there. I want to hear them more than I've ever heard them before. Seems well good enough, isn't it? It really is. Well, two weeks ago, Seamus Coleman showed just what Everton Football Club means to him when he celebrated his late equaliser against Swansea City in a rather aggressive manner. Never shy of giving 100% every time he pulls on the royal blue jersey, Seamus is hoping that the high-profile game of Goodison this weekend is just what the team needs to end a run of indifferent results. Uh, the way things are going at the minute, we just, we just want to get out there and, and put things right. And you know It's going to be a tough game against Manchester United, but um, we have to go out there and put things right. Uh, you know, we have to do the, these kind of interviews because it's, it's part of the protocol, but at the end of the day, you can say all the right things here and... and sound great but we have to do it on, on on a Sunday on the pitch and as I said we can talk we can talk and say all the right things here but we have to we have to go out and perform and make sure we do it for 90 minutes not just 45 minutes. Can you say confidence from the home form still unbeaten? Yeah it has to be it has to be take confidence out of that you know the the home form has been good um, I know we needed a late goal against Swansea but the home form has been good and you know, we if we win on Sunday, we go ahead of them in the league. So we just have to we have to look forward and we have to do the right things on the pitch and and make sure when we come off that pitch, we can look ourselves in the mirror because you know there's been a few games recently where we haven't been nowhere near good enough. Uh, we may have played well in spells, but uh, we need to do it over the 90 minutes. Obviously, last home game against Swansea, you got the equaliser. Is the manager telling you to get in the box a bit more? Um, no, not really. I think that was a case of it was getting very late in the game and it was just trying to get bodies in the box and thankfully, you know, I came up with a goal and, and we got the draw out of the game. But um, you know, if I get forward then so be it. But, you know, first and foremost we need to we need to try and be tight at the back. Um, three goals so far this season for Club and Country. You happy with that so far? Yeah, it's 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 a good return. Um, you know, I didn't get many last season, which was disappointing. So it's nice to get off the mark early and, and try and build on it. But you know, when I say it, I mean it. It's it's important that the that the lads get the three points rather than than me scoring goals. So uh, if I can get it, then so be it. But but we need to start winning games. Seamus is now the captain of the Republic of Ireland Snods, and he's got the ultimate accolade as well at the weekend. He's on the front cover of the match program. There you go. There's Sunday's. <laughs> front cover of the match programme against Manchester United and Seamus is now one of those characters, the big characters in the dressing room, isn't he? He certainly is, there's no question about it. He's been here several years now. Um, he's, he's a mainstay at Everton Football Club. He's a great full-back, there's no question about that. Scores goals and just by his reaction when he scored that equalising goal tells me everything about Seamus uh, Coleman. He, he's a leader, he's a winner more than anything. and. Uh, People might have questioned his celebration, but not me. I love that. The passion that he's shown. And that was just to get an equaliser. He wanted to get back to the halfway line to go and get the winner. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I have, have a lot of time Seamus as a player, as a person. And uh, he's a terrific player. There's no question about that. And well loved in at the Republic of Ireland as well. Captain of them. Don't come any better. He certainly is a great lad down at Finch Farm. Right, our final interviewee on this week's programme is Owen Cooman. 
The Blues assistant manager knows full well that recent results just haven't been good enough, but he assured us that the players have picked themselves up from last Sunday's disappointment and are ready to go again against Manchester United this weekend. The next day is a different day again and you have to uh, look ahead for the next game against United. And uh, it's for us a big game and uh, we, we have to work very, very hard uh, this week on training and, and, and we will. And uh, we have to do that on the, on, the, on the Sunday game because for our fans we have to perform well and we know and we have to, to do that. Do you learn more from your players about how they react to a defeat than perhaps you do after a win? Uh, for everyone it's, it's different, for the, for the fans, for, for us, for, tra for the players. Uh, if it is Monday uh, you, you stay up uh, on, on a nice way or on a wrong way and this time it was not so nice the Monday, but finally uh, after the Tuesday you're looking ahead for the Sunday, what I say, and, uh, and that's football. It's very simple, uh, when we win against uh, United we are sixth and above United, that's football as well. How important could a home game be then in getting that good feeling back? The, uh, the fans will uh, see that uh, the players like to work and, uh, and, and you can win and you can lose, that's football. That's not the, the, the biggest problem. Uh, you have to fight for it as a team and that's the most important and the fans will see that. If they see that, they will support you. Uh, your record against Mourinho so far, three games played in the Premier League and, and no defeat. So you'll be looking to keep that up this weekend. Yes, OK, that, uh, that are aesthetics, but uh, the only thing for me counts. Uh, when we win, we are above uh, Man United and that's the most important thing for, uh, for us and for Everton. It's not Manchester United. Possibly an indifferent season by their standards and expectations. They're beatable, aren't they? They are beatable. There's no question about it. And uh, hopefully they'll be beatable on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Irwin's just stipulated there that, uh, that it's a big game. The lads hopefully have forgot about Sunday and now are focused, after a couple of days training, uh, focused on this game. Uh, it's important how we set off. We want to produce the first tattle, the first corner, the first shot. And let's take the game to Man United. Let's get this crowd behind us. Uh, if, if we do, it's fantastic playing at Goodison Park to hear the fans get behind you when a tackle goes in. It's fantastic. So we've got to get off on the right footing and we've got to get, take it to Man United from the first minute to the last whistle. And after last night's booking, no Wayne Rooney. Yeah. Um, will it be disappointing? I'm glad he's not playing. I really am. They've got some good players, but hopefully we can cope with that. Well, there have been some truly memorable Goodison games against Manchester United over the years, haven't there? The two Duncan Ferguson 1-0 spring instantly to mind. So to the time we scored twice in stoppage time to draw 3-3. And what about Marouane Fellaini's winner on the first day of the season or the 3-0 demolition job a couple of years ago? Well, we could certainly do with another one on Sunday. Find out if we get one by listening to full commentary with me and Snods on EvertonFC.com. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll be back in seven days with another Everton show.